subject of occlusion can be very confusing for dental students. Today, we will discuss the possible reasons for this confusion, and we will attempt to demystify this very important subject. Let's begin with a discussion of language in general. Language evolves and changes to suit changes in the society. Definitions of words will also evolve to keep up with new discoveries about a subject. However, changing definitions of existing words can make it more difficult to communicate. For example, what happens when one person is using one definition and the other person is using a different definition of the same word? Or how about different words that can describe the same thing? What happens when two people are discussing the same thing but are using different terminology? It's possible that arguments can arise. The subject of prosthodontics has its own language that needs to be learned. Once you learn a specific term, you also need to know alternate terms that describe the same concept. Plus, you also have to keep up with any changes in the definition of terms. So you can see that redefinition of the terms can create a great deal of confusion. In order to learn the language of a subject, in other words, its nomenclature, you will need to know or memorize the terminology and definitions. As award-winning author Frank Sonnenberg said, learning is less about memorizing facts and more about the ability to think. So although memorization of terms, including all possible definitions and alternate terms, is absolutely necessary, understanding the concepts, the why, and using judgment in applying the concepts of dentistry is what being a doctor of dentistry is all about. Let's go back to basics. In anatomy, the stomatognathic system consists of the mouth, jaws, and closely associated structures, including the teeth. Additionally, the temporomandibular joint is a modified hinge type of synovial joint made up of the condylar process of the mandible and the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. This joint hinges and glides upon opening, which is also referred to as rotation and translation. The TMJ also moves from side to side. So the subject of occlusion has to take into account the joint movement and position and also the tooth relationships during those movements. Let's look at the mesial inclination of teeth from a lateral perspective. What might be the significance of this? Is it possible that the natural inclination of the teeth might play a role in mesial migration? Let's take a look at some theories. In physical anthropology, it is believed that rough, abrasive diets such as eating dirt-covered carrots pulled directly out of the ground, cause the wearing of interproximal and occlusal surfaces. The mesial migration of the teeth then closed the gaps, which allowed space for second and third molars to erupt. Is this a possible explanation for why most people have third molars that don't fit the arch? The genetic theory posits that intermingling of races and cultures with different DNA will result in children with mom's jaws and dad's teeth that don't quite align, and so the third molars do not have sufficient space to erupt and function normally. Which theory do you like best? Could there be a little bit of truth in both? These are the types of questions that one asks in the critical thinking process. Let's look at the occlusal plane and the curve of SPI. The curve of SPI is the front to back curve from the cusp of the mandibular canine that goes through the posterior teeth to the anterior portion of the condyle. Looking at the vertical alignment of the teeth from an anterior view, we can see that the crowns of the maxillary teeth have a buccal inclination while the crowns of the mandibular teeth incline lingually. This inclination makes it possible for maxillary palatal cusps to contact mandibular teeth and mandibular buccal cusps to contact the maxillary teeth. 
Are working cusps or functional cusps angled toward or away from the teeth that they occlude against? The curve of Wilson is the transverse occlusal curve that goes from left to right when viewed from the posterior and is created by the axial inclination of the maxillary versus the mandibular teeth. In the rest position, the teeth do not occlude and there's a freeway space present between the teeth. The rest position is mostly determined by the musculature. Therefore, it is a muscle-guided position. Remember that there are several words that can mean the same thing. In this case, rest position can also be referred to as postural position or physiologic rest position. Mastication or chewing is completely achieved through the lateral contacting movement of the teeth. During mastication, the food is moved from one side to the other and is ground thoroughly with the lateral excursive jaw movements. Food is kept on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth by facial muscles, the tongue, and jaw movements. This allows for maximum chewing efficiency of the food. Let's discuss CR, MIP, and CO. CO, or centric occlusion, is one of those terms that has been redefined. However, it is commonly used interchangeably with MIP, maximum intercuspal position. The definition of MIP is the complete intercuspation of the opposing teeth independent of condylar position. It's the jaw position that allows the greatest interdigitation of the teeth, which is what you would see with hand articulated casts. This position is related to the teeth, not the muscle or the bone. So it is a tooth guided position. Keep in mind that dry swallowing occurs in CO and on board exams, CO equals MIP, equals IP, and equals IC. Now we will look at centric relation, or CR. CR can also be referred to as retruded contact precision, or RCP, and has also been referred to as the terminal position. This is the most widely debated term and has many definitions, some of which are contradictory. For our purposes, we will define CR as the most anterior superior position of the condyle in the glenoid fossa. CR is a ligament guided position. For the purpose of the boards, CR equals RCP equals terminal position. An article by Palascar, Morali, and Bansal states, the term CR has become thoroughly confusing because of many conflicting definitions. Unfortunately, definition of CR changed repeatedly over the past 10 decades. The preponderance of evidence available suggests that there is no one ideal position of the condyle in the glenoid fossa, but there is a range of normal positions. No dentist is knowledgeable enough to know the proper three-dimensional position for two asymmetrically angulated condyles irregularly and individually suspended in a polycentric hinge joint. So with all of the controversy surrounding CR, how is it useful to us? CR is useful in complete denture prosthetics as a starting point for vertical dimension, re-establishing vertical dimension of occlusion due to posterior collapse or for fabricating occlusal splints. CR is not a useful reference for fully dentate patients or partially edentulous patients where MIP is reproducible and clearly defined. In dentate patients and also in partially edentulous patients who have posterior occlusion, the retruded contact occurs in the posterior of the mouth, 
which causes anterior teeth to separate because the maxillary teeth do not overlap the mandibular teeth, there is an increase in distance between anterior incisal edges and therefore an increased vertical dimension. This slide demonstrates increased occlusal vertical dimension, decreased vertical overlap, and increased horizontal overlap. In order to determine whether to restore to CR, or COMIP, we need to keep in mind that the occlusal scheme and the vertical dimension of occlusion need to be comfortable for the patient's joint and musculature in function as well as in rest. It has been suggested to determine the position based on visible and evident landmarks, such as the teeth, instead of landmarks that are not clinically visible, such as the joint and fossa. In general terms, use MIP on fully dentate patients who have no TMJ dysfunction and no change in VDO is needed. Use CR when treating edentulous patients, when increasing VDO, and in the fabrication of some splints. For the partially edentulous patient, if CR equals MIP, and MIP is reproducible, go ahead and use MIP. If CR does not equal MIP, but MIP is clearly defined, use MIP again. If CR does not equal MIP, and MIP is not clearly defined, then use CR. If posterior teeth are missing in one or both arches, use CR. When analyzing occlusion via maximum intercuspation, we can see that the buccal cusp of the posterior maxillary teeth overlap the buccal cusp of the posterior mandibular teeth. Anterior maxillary teeth are positioned facially to anterior mandibular teeth and overlap the mandibular teeth normally about one quarter to one third of the occlusal gingival height. The terms functional and working are both used to describe the cusps that occlude with the opposing arch in maximum intercuspation. Working cusps are the palatal cusps on maxillary and buccal cusps on mandibular posterior teeth. Working cusps are rounder because they wear down as they function. Non-working cusps tend to be pointier in most cases. The word balancing is used to refer to non-functional and non-working. A link to the YouTube video, Occlusion for the Dental Staff, is provided for you on Blackboard. I'm sorry to have to tell you that the molar contacts in the intercuspal position, or MIP, is something that you're going to have to memorize for the boards. Here's an example of a question from Dental Dex. In class one occlusion, the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar lines up with the mesiobuccal groove of the mandibular first molar. In fact, the relationship between maxillary first molar mesiobuccal cusps and mandibular first molar buccal grooves defines the angle's molar classifications. In class one, the cusp lines up with the groove in class two, the cusp is mesial to the groove. In class three, the cusp is distal to the groove. The examples shown in this slide are extreme cases for the purpose of illustration and clear visualization, but remember there doesn't have to be this much of a discrepancy. Even if the buccal cusp is slightly mesial to the groove, it is still class two. Tables 19.1 and 19.2 from your Schillingberg textbook contains information that you should commit to memory as well. When teeth occlude, the centric retention cusps or working cusps can contact the fossa in the opposing arch in a variety of ways. The definitions of the types of occlusal contact is also something that students will need to memorize. 
For example, tripodism means contact on three points. This nomenclature is intended to communicate a concept and a type of shorthand. There is no clinical evidence of superiority of one versus the other that I have found, but if anyone can find a valid paper, please bring it to my attention. When in ideal occlusion, the maxillary posterior teeth are about half a tooth distal to their mandibular counterparts. This is because the maxillary anterior teeth are relatively wider mesiodistally than the mandibular anterior teeth. The picket fence technique will help you to quickly determine these relationships for board exams and is another study tool that you may use. Jaw movements from side to side are referred to as lateral excursions. Working movements refer to the side that the mandible is moving towards. These movements are also referred to as laterotrusive. A right working movement means that the mandible is moving to the right. Non-working movements, also known as mediotrusive or balancing movements, are on the side of the mandible that is moving towards the midline. When the mandible moves to the right, the left side moves toward the midline and therefore is the non-working side. Canine guided occlusion is when the canines are the last teeth to touch during a working side movement. Other names for canine guided are canine rise, cuspid rise, and cuspid protected occlusion also canine protected occlusion. When the posterior teeth also participate in a working excursion, it is termed group function. Neither functional scheme has been proven to be better than the other. This image shows lateral excursions with cuspid rise on the working or lateral obtrusive side. Note that teeth on the opposite side do not touch. Due to various ligaments, masticatory muscle orientation, and canine guidance, the mandible doesn't move in a directly horizontal manner. Instead, it moves diagonally, so the teeth will also follow a similar path. Non-working cusps should not contact in a natural dentition. When they do, it is referred to as a non-working interference. These interferences can be harmful to the joint. Be sure to remember these terms. Interferences and premature contacts. When the mouth closes, all posterior teeth should contact at the same time. When one tooth hits before all others, it is a premature contact. If anterior teeth touch in centric occlusion, it is called anterior coupling. Where premature contacts exist, the TMJ absorbs abnormal stress. The muscles of mastication become tired and sore. The tooth may become tender and mobile with widening of the PDL. The protrusive movement refers to the anterior motion of the mandible, which results in an end-to-end -end contact of the anterior teeth. Protrusion of the mandible is affected by the action of the lateral pterygoid muscles contracting bilaterally. The path of the mandible during protrusion is determined by the relationship of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. This path is referred to anterior guidance and is influenced by anterior division. For the purpose of evaluating anterior guidance, Anterior division should be examined independently from molar classification. In anterior division 1, the maxillary anterior tooth angulation falls within the normal parameters previously covered in slides 9 and 11. This relationship allows the incisal edge of the mandibular teeth to glide along a slope created by the lingual surface of the maxillary anterior teeth. When the mandible is fully protruded, the maxillary anterior teeth will contact the mandibular anterior teeth, while the posterior teeth will not be in contact. This is referred to as mutually protected occlusion. In anterior division 2, 
the maxillary anterior tooth angulation is reversed to the normal angulation. Instead of providing a protected path for disclusion, as the mandibular incisors contact the maxillary lingual surface, the mandible is forced posteriorly. This relationship is sometimes referred to as a distalizing inclined plane and is theorized to cause damage to the disc and joint of the TMJ. Anterior Division III is seldom categorized or discussed in the United States. It refers to a labial flaring of the maxillary teeth alone or both the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth, resulting in an anterior open bite and lack of anterior guidance. Theoretically, this is caused by a severe tongue thrust. Anterior crossbite is mostly seen in skeletal class three. These images show protrusive excursion and anterior guidance. I have included a video from YouTube that shows anterior guidance and you can find it on Blackboard. The term mutually protected occlusion refers to an occlusal scheme in which the posterior teeth prevent excessive contact of the anterior teeth in MIP and the anterior teeth disengage the posterior teeth in all mandibular excursive movements. When a patient loses posterior teeth, it damages the anterior teeth and therefore restoration of the anterior teeth cannot have long-term success unless the posterior teeth are somehow replaced. Options for replacement include implants and removable partial dentures, as well as fixed partial dentures. The specific movements for a mandibular first molar in class one occlusion is information that you may need to memorize for the boards. Also for the boards, be sure to distinguish between these three terms, Bennett movement, shift, and angle. Movement refers to the left and right condylar motions. Shift is the movement of the mandible towards the working side. Angle is the measurement taken after the non-working side has moved anteriorly and medially. Gothic arch tracings are useful in full denture cases. The tracing shows the position of the mandible in CR as well as protrusive and lateral excursions. This image shows the Gothic arch apparatus, which is used for making intraoral tracings. Links for mandibular movement videos and other learning aids have been posted for you on Blackboard. Be sure to use these as an additional resource for studying for your boards. Ideal occlusal relationships for complete dentures are achieved through balanced occlusion. This is the simultaneous contacting of the upper and lower teeth on the right and left side during lateral excursions and simultaneously in the anterior and posterior occlusal areas during protrusion. This scheme was developed to prevent a tipping or rotating of the denture bases in the mouth during function. For fixed prosthodontics, Ideal occlusion is mutually protected occlusion. And for removable partial dentures, the occlusal forms of the teeth on the removable partial denture must be made to conform to an already established occlusal pattern. An articulator is a mechanical device used in dentistry to which casts of the maxillary and mandibular teeth are affixed in order to reproduce the mandible in relation to the maxilla. Types of articulators include non-adjustable, semi-adjustable, and highly adjustable. Examples of each are pictured here. Semi-adjustable articulators are used in all removable partial denture cases. The face bow is a device used in dentistry to determine the positional relationships of the maxilla to the TMJ of a patient. The face bow allows for proper positioning of dental casts on an articulator. Dental cast should never be mounted on an articulator without first taking a face bow record. Arbitrary mounting will fail to reproduce excursive movements on the articulator and will result in failure of the restorations. This image shows a properly mounted maxillary cast on an articulator. 
a bite registration is necessary for properly relating the mandibular and maxillary cast to each other prior to mounting. The images illustrate a wax bite on the left and a VPS bite on the right. Notice the interdental fins captured by the VPS material. If the cast impressions were taken in alginate, wax is the best registration material to use, since the VPS fins will need to be trimmed off prior to putting the cast together, and this process is time consuming and sometimes results in inaccurate cast relationships. Once the casts are properly articulated, they are stabilized using rubber bands or other methods prior to mounting the mandibular cast. The stabilized casts are then returned to the articulator and the articulator is inverted to permit completion of the mounting process. This slide shows the properly mounted and finished casts. For the rest of this lecture, we will focus on removable partial dentures. The following are the steps for determining occlusion in removable partial dentures. Analysis of the existing occlusion, recording of centric relation or MIP occlusion using bite registration, recording of vertical dimension of occlusion, the number and distribution of remaining teeth, the existing periodontal conditions, and the type of occlusion in the opposing arch. The step-by-step -step process will be covered in future lectures. Let's review CR versus MIP as it relates to removable partial dentures. If centric relation and MIP coincide, then use MIP. If centric relation and MIP do not coincide, but the MIP is clearly defined, use MIP. If centric relation and the MIP do not coincide and the MIP is not clearly defined, use centric relation. If posterior teeth are not present in one or both arches, use centric relation. This is the end of our lecture.